Vaccines are very safe. If someone gets sick after vaccination, it is usually either a coincidence, an error in administering the vaccine, or very rarely a problem with the vaccine itself. That's why we have vaccine safety systems. Robust vaccine safety systems allow health workers and experts to react immediately to any problems that may arise. They can examine the problem rigorously and scientifically look at the data and then promptly address the problem. WHO works closely with countries to make sure that vaccines can do what they do best, prevent disease without risks. New vaccines against malaria, meningitis and encephalitis in Asia and Africa are now being thoroughly monitored with support from WHO. Vaccines are one of the safest tools we have to prevent disease and ensure a healthy future for all children. I think we cannot overemphasize the fact that, that we really don't have very good safety uh, monitoring systems in many countries, and this adds to the miscommunication and the misapprehensions because we're not able to give clear-cut answers when people ask questions about the deaths that have occurred due to a particular vaccine, and this always gets blown up in the media. Uh, one should be able to give uh, a, a very factual account of what exactly has happened and what the cause of deaths are, but in most cases, there's some obfuscation at that level, and, and therefore there's uh, less and less trust then in, in, in the system. Putting in place the mechanisms, whether they're cohort studies or whether they're sentinel surveillance sites, to be able to, uh, to monitor uh, what's going on and report back and then for corrective action to be taken because unexpected things could arise uh, after introduction and one always has to be prepared. As we've seen you know, in the history of many drugs, you've, uh, you've heard about, I mean, learned about adverse events only after the drug's been licensed and introduced into the population. So I think that, that risk is all, all, always there and the population needs to understand that and, and feel confident that mechanisms are being put in place to, to study uh, some of those things. My name is Marion Gruber. I'm with the Office of Vaccines at the Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And as I was reading the paper that I was part of writing, I would like to sort of underscore a few points made in that paper and also reflect on some of the issues presented to us regarding novel vac vaccine platforms. So I think vaccines, regardless whether they are generated using new and innovative technology or whether more standard um, conventional technologies are applied, they do require safety surveillance and monitoring that is specifically tailored to the vaccine that is under consideration using available pharmacovigilance systems. So, in other words, the risk management plan for each particular vaccine will need to take into the consideration the pre-licensure safety database, potential safety signals that may have been identified during pre-licensure clinical safety trials, other perhaps even theoretical safety concerns, and also need to take into the, to consideration um, the disease to be prevented, the target population and the proposed indication in order to really inform risk management. I'll just say a few words about adjuvants. So adjuvants are added to vaccines for many reasons, but primarily to make the vaccines work. And as we enter the, the next decade, and we're trying to make vaccines against malaria, TB, HIV, 
GBS, RSV, it is extremely likely that these are going to require adjuvants. And yet, every time we add an adjuvant to a vaccine, the people that are using the vaccine look at it, and if there's an adverse event, we know what they're going to say. It's the adjuvant that caused that adverse event. And we've seen clinical studies in, in the past where a single adverse event has been blamed on the adjuvant in the, in the development trials. And things come to a standstill while we go in and spend many years trying to investigate, is the theoretical immunostimulation induced by that adjuvant responsible for the adverse event? Now, over the years of GACs, over the last 15 years, we've seen many accusations. I'm going to begin off with aluminium. So this was accused of causing um, myos, my, macrophagic myofasciitis. And yet, this complex word uh, typically only occurs many years after a potential administration of the aluminium. And as we go forwards with the immuno, immunostimulators like MPL, like the saponins, we are likely to see every time that there is an association, be it temporal or not temporal, the first accusation is it is the adjuvant. And yet, without adjuvants, we are not going to have the next generation of vaccines. And many of the vaccines that we do have, ranging from tetanus through to HPV, require adjuvants in order for them to work. So the challenge that we have in front of us is how do we build confidence in this? And the confidence, first of all, comes from the regulatory agencies, I look to Marianne. When we add an adjuvant, it's because it is essential. We do not add adjuvants to vaccines because we want to do so. But when we add them, it, in, it adds to the complexity. And I give courses every year on how do you develop vaccines, how do you make vaccines, and the first lesson is, while you're making your vaccine, if you can avoid using an adjuvant, please do so. Lesson two is, if you're going to use an adjuvant, use one that has a history of safety. And lesson three is, if you're not going to do that, think very carefully. It seems to me that adjuvants multiply the immunogenicity of the antigens that they are added to, and that is their intention. It seems to me they multiply the reactogenicity in many instances. And therefore, it seems to me that it is not to unexpected if they multiply the incidence of adverse reactions that are associated with the antigen, but may not have been detected through lack of statistical power in the original studies. Now, I wonder if this thinking is correct, and if it is, whether this has some implications for the way we do pharmacovigilance. Because one vaccine that is, has one antigen and an adjuvant, and another vaccine that has a different antigen and no adjuvant, the reason for the difference is not immediately obvious. So with the local reactogenicity, you are correct. Um, as we add adjuvants, especially some of the more recent adjuvants, such as the ASO1, sapin and derived adjuvants, we do see increased local reactogenicity. The primary concern, though, usually is systemic adverse events rather than local adverse events. And we, we tend to get in the phase two and the phase three studies quite good data on the local reactogenicity. Those of us in this room that are beyond the age of 50 who have had the pleasure of having the recent shingles vaccine will know that this does have quite significant local reactogenicity. If you got the vaccine, you know that you got the vaccine. Um, but this is not the major health concern. The major health concern which we are seeing are accusations of long-term long -term effects. So what we have to bear in mind is that we don't use adjuvants by themselves. The adjuvant is used in combination with an antigen. And an adjuvant may be, give quite different responses depending on which antigen it is combined with. So the fact that an adjuvant is shown to be safe with one antigen might give a different response with another antigen because of other things that are with that, with that second antigen, including impurities. So to come back to this, I'm going to once again point to the regulators. It comes down to um, ensuring that we, we 
conduct the phase two and the phase three studies with adequate size and with, the ad with appropriate measurement. Doing surveillance is necessary, but coming, understanding how these things work is also necessary so that we can assess plausibility. So in our clinical trials, we're, we are actually using relatively small sample sizes. And when we do that, we're at risk of tyranny of small numbers, which is you just need a single case of Wegener's granulomatosis and your vaccine has to solve Walt's, how do you prove a null hypothesis? And it takes years and years to try to figure, to figure that out. So it's a real conundrum, right? Getting the right, the right size, dealing with the tyranny of small numbers, making sure that you can, can really do it. And so I think one of the, the things that we really need to invest in are kind of better biomarkers, better mechanistic understanding of how these things work so we can better understand um, adverse events as they come up. One of the additional issues that complicates safety evaluation is if you look at and you struggle with the length of follow-up that should be adequate in a, let's say, pre-licensure or even post-marketing study, if that's even possible. Because, I mean, one, one has to acknowledge the longer you follow up, the more you perhaps see adverse events that have nothing to do with the adjuvant vaccine combination, but maybe, again, and coincidental. But the problem is, you know, how do you deal with that data? And again, as you mentioned, pre-licensure clinical trials may not be powered enough. It's also the subject population that you administer the adjuvant to, because we've seen data presented to us where an adjuvant, a particular adjuvant added to a vaccine antigen did really nothing when administered to a certain population, and it's usually the elderly, you know, compared to, to administering the same formulation to, to younger age strata. So, so these are things which uh, need to be considered as well and further complicate safety and effectiveness evaluation of adjuvants combined with vaccine antigens. Dr. Sun. Yeah, I just want to make a clarification on the use of vaccines in pregnancy. Unless there is a study of that vaccine in pregnant women, uh, even though that age indication you know, uh, may fall in within that, that age indication, it, it is still not considered, it's, we will be still, use in pregnant women will still be considered off label. We're having the discussions, something was just going through my mind, which I will need clarification. Outside vaccines, for instance, we take septrin and fancy that they potentiate each other. And there are so many other drugs like that. I cast back my mind to our situation in Nigeria, where at six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, a child is being given different antigens from different companies. And these vaccines have different adjuvants, different preservatives, and so on. You go again to nine months. Currently, the child at nine months will receive main A. That same child will receive yellow fever. That same child will receive measles vaccine. Something crosses my mind. Is there a possibility of these adjuvants, preservatives, cross-reacting amongst themselves? Have there ever been a study on the possibility of cross-reactions from the panel members that you can share the experience with us? Because this is one thing that I'm also crossing my mind. Going back home, this is an area that we will need to work with the regulatory agency. Let's even see what is happening. Is there any possibility? So we need guidance from the panel members whether there's ever been any study on these cross reactions of multiple antigens from different factory companies given to each other at the same time. What counsel do you have for us? Thank you. Any comment on using this vaccine at the same time with other adjuvanted vaccines? We have no data to uh, make um, a recommendation one way or the other. So um, just so you, just to sort of put this in context of other vaccines, um, while preclinical studies were not done using these vaccines simultaneously, our general approach to immunizations is that um, they should be given, they can be given at the same time in different um, limbs. This is a, a very important question uh, because in general the clinical trials with any particular uh, new product uh, frequently is done uh, just by itself and then ultimately 
frequently the regulators will ask uh, if that vaccine could be added to the routine immunization program. And so frequently a trial is done uh, with that new vaccine uh, in addition to the regular uh, regimen. But your question is almost kind of the next step uh, because in, in real practice, frequently there are uh, multiple uh, vaccines from different uh, manufacturers that then may be uh, received at a different um, uh, age schedules, et cetera. And if you take a look at the um, immunization schedule over the last, uh, let's say, 15, 20 years in high-income countries, um, as well as in uh, low-resource countries, uh, the schedule has gotten uh, more and more complex. Clearly. And so if you take a look at the um, exposure, what we call the vaccine exposure, in the typical adverse event report to a spontaneous reporting system in any country, you'll see that increase in heterogeneity of those different vaccine exposures, especially if you take the manufacture into account. Now, the only way to tease that out is if you had a large population database like the Vaccine Safety Data Link, as well as some of the other um, national databases that are coming to being, where the actual vaccine exposure is tracked down to that level of specificity of who is the manufacturer, what is the lot number, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's uh, initiative to try to make the uh, vaccine label information uh, barcoded so that it includes that level of information so that in the future when we do these type of studies, we're able to uh, tease that out. <clears throat> and, and in order to, be, to, as each time you subdivide, then the uh, sample size gets becoming more and more challenging. And that's what I said earlier today about that we're really only in the beginning of the era of large data sets where hopefully you could start to um, kind of uh, harmonize the databases for multiple studies. Uh, and there's actually an uh, initiative underway. Uh, Helen there uh, uh, may want to comment on it to try to get more national uh, vaccine safety database uh, linked together so we could start to answer these type of questions that you just raised. 